Hi, and welcome for joining us, guys. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, first of all, welcome to our webinar on the introduction to ABA um, speech and language services and occupational therapy. My name is Kelsey Helsper, and I'm a BCBA with Beerman, and that stands for Board Certified Behavior Analyst. And I'm going to be talking about the ABA portion of this webinar. And I'll let my other panelists introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Jessica, and I am a speech language pathologist at the Fort Wayne location. Hi, my name is Connie, and I'm the speech language pathologist at the Avon location. Um, and hi, I'm Maggie, and I'm the OT at Westfield and Broad Ripple locations. Okay, so first we're going to talk about our mission a little bit before we get started. So our mission is always to provide support to you, your child, and your whole family. This process is about making your daily life easier along with your child's and really everyone that's involved in your child's life. We also make sure to use behavior analytic research and science to guide all of our decision-making on what to teach and how to teach it. And while this is important, we do understand that a lot of this information can be really difficult to understand. So that's why we're here to help break it down for you. And lastly, we wanna make sure that we're always collaborating to make your experience as meaningful as possible. And we want this information to be helpful and useful to you. We also want your input and feedback as we um, are going through this process. So please never hesitate to reach out to anyone on your team for support. So the objectives of this training tonight are to define reinforcement and how it's used to change behavior, to understand why behavior happens, not just what it looks like, and to understand speech and OT services at Beerman. So also before we get started, I want you to understand your communication options. So this is a, um, a participation webinar in which I will be pausing frequently to ask questions and to respond to questions or to ask questions yourself, you can do so using the chat feature, which you'll find um, in your toolbar. And you can use these visuals on this slide as well to kind of find where that is. But we found that the chat is the easiest way um, and the most efficient way to communicate during the webinar. Um, and for the chat feature, you have the option to send your answer to either the panelists, who is all of us that you can see, or panelists and attendees. So if you select panelists, what you will type will be displayed only to the four of us. But if you chat to panelists and attendees, everyone um, that is in this webinar will be able to see your responses. So either way you choose to respond, your personal information will be excluded from that discussion. So another way that we're gonna communicate together is by taking a poll. So I'm going to launch a poll that you will see pop up on your screen. And if you don't mind taking this poll really quickly, I would like to know how much ABA experience do you have? I'm gonna relaunch here. I don't think it launched. There you go, you should see it now. Perfect, thank you guys so much for participating. All right, so now we are going to start the poll about how much speech therapy experience you have. Um, uh, as a background on speech therapy, speech therapists are often some of the first therapists you might encounter in the intervention process. So if your child has previ previously received services or is currently receiving outside services, um, we can collaborate with providers to help facilitate carryover at Beerman. And if you have not yet received services, I hope this presentation helps you answer some questions you might have about SLPs and the team approach to treatment. And we're gonna launch this poll. Um, the one for speech did not launch. So 
fill this out as if you were doing um, the speech one and then we'll launch it again for OT. All right, we're going to go ahead and end the poll. Thank you guys for participating. Okay, and then this poll um, is how much OT experience do you have? Um, perfect. Oh, it looks like it says ABA experience, but just uh, do it how if you were um, talking about occupational therapy. Sorry, we're having some technical difficulties with, the, with these polls tonight, guys. Great. Thank you guys so much. Okay, so first we're gonna dive into Applied Behavior Analysis or ABA. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is um, what ABA is. So we um, talk a lot about behavior. So first let's talk about what behavior is. Um, it is anything you do, your child does, your boss does, the lady down the street does, um, anything that any person does is considered behavior. So when defining behavior, it's important to be objective and precise. Um, so avoiding using more subjective terms like tantrum or um, things like that, um, making sure that it's measurable so that anybody observing the behavior is able to identify what behavior we're looking at. And again, avoiding subjectivity, like um, talking about being upset or scared, because if you or I um, were given that information, we may look at that in a different way or understand that term a little differently. So um, I'd like for you guys to be thinking about as we talk through this portion, what is a behavior that you would like to decrease um, or a, one of your child's behaviors that you would like to see decrease? And try to think about that as we're going through this presentation. So why is behavior important to us? So we wanna make sure that desirable behaviors are increased and undesirable behaviors are decreased and we do that simultaneously. So there are things that we try to target that will increase desirable behaviors and things that we target to decrease those challenging or undesirable behaviors. So here's an example. Sammy hits his mom every time he wants a cookie and an appropriate replacement behavior for that undesirable behavior would be he is taught to request cookie by saying cookie and now his requesting for cookie increases and his hitting decreases. So you can see how all of those things work together to increase the behaviors we want to see increase and decrease the behaviors that we want to see decrease. So here are some of the behaviors that ABA can be used for to increase. So communication is one of them that we work on frequently. Um, social behavior, so playing with others, understanding social cues, um, understanding how to communicate with different peers or people. Toilet training, um, that's a pretty common one, especially for the younger kiddos starting out. Um, just understanding the steps of toilet training and how to get used to going to the bathroom on the toilet. Different play behaviors like um, pretend play or engaging with other siblings or peers, uh, understanding how to play with different items functionally. All of those things are things that we um, want to work to increase. And also just independence with daily living skills, um, such as brushing teeth, putting on clothes, feeding um, themselves. So. Um, Really, you will see that um, Maggie, Jessica, and Connie might cover some of these other things as well as they're presenting. Um, and that's where a lot of our things overlap. And in addition, ABA can be used to decrease certain things like challenging behavior, um, repetitive behaviors, and stereotypy, 
or simply the duration it takes to complete a certain task. If they have a really difficult time um, completing their morning routine or um, different things that should be taking less time or taking more time, um, we can work to decrease the amount of time it takes them to do those things as well. And really ABA is all about communication. So regardless of what the behavior looks like, your child is trying to communicate what he or she wants and needs in that moment. So we talk a lot about the desirable behaviors and the undesirable behaviors, but what we really try to focus on is what is the desired outcome that they're trying to get out of that um, behavior. So this is where reinforcement comes in. Um, you may or may not have heard of this term before, but reinforcement is whatever happens after the behavior that increases the likelihood that behavior um, is going to happen in the future. So we wanna see those desirable behaviors continue. Um, so what is gonna make those behaviors continue and how can we reinforce those positive behaviors? So um, let's practice what that looks like. So the way that we determine what the desired outcome is, is to um, focus on the functions of behavior. And there are four different functions of behavior that we look at. So access is one of them. So an access behavior is attempting to get an item, activity, or environment. So an example of that would be um, someone saying, I want cookie exchanging a picture. Um, let's say they communicate with a picture exchange system. They could give you a picture of cookies so you know that they want the cookie. They could point to the cookie. They could take your arm and lead you to the pantry to get a cookie, um, anything like that. Or it could be crying to get access to a cookie or another item. So any of those would be examples of them engaging in a behavior to get access to something. Um, your child could also be engaging in um, an attention seeking behavior. So that is a behavior occurring to get the attention from someone else. So that could look like um, your child hitting their sibling to um, get a toy item that they have or to get their attention, um, asking them to look at you, um, or tapping you on the shoulder, any of those that are trying to get a response from you or to get your attention would be an attention seeking behavior. And then an escape maintained behavior would be occurring to get away from something aversive. So that could be running away if you presented a food that they didn't like, like broccoli. Um, it could be pushing something away if you present something they don't want to have, saying no um, whenever you present something. Um, the form of the behavior could be different, but um, the most important thing to look at when we're talking about ABA is why the behavior is happening. So um, that's where we can categorize these into these different categories. So the last one is self-stimulation, and that is a behavior occurring because it's automatically reinforced. So that could be chewing on a pen cap, flapping hands, biting fingernails, um, that could be reciting or scripting your um, favorite lines from a video, but all of those behaviors are, um, are not needing the reinforcement of someone else or something else in the environment. They are all self-stimulated. Um, so those are the four different categories that we look for when we talk about the functions of behavior and just talking about the function of behavior and really being able to identify those things will help you to determine um, what your response can be um, or how you can increase the desirable behavior or decrease the undesirable behavior. So I'm going to la launch a poll right now. And you guys should see it pop up on your screen. Um, let's see, I think actually I am a little bit ahead of that. Um, Okay, so next we're gonna talk about reinforcement um, and circle back to that. So there's different types of reinforcement that you can provide, but we categorize them into two different categories of positive reinforcement, which is something added after the behavior occurs and negative reinforcement, which is something removed after the behavior occurs. So positive reinforcement, like I mentioned, is getting something that they want. So an example could be Lily raises her hand and the teacher calls on her to answer a question. 
Carson's brother has his favorite toy. So Carson grabs the toy from his brother and runs out of the room. Or Timmy is in his bedroom playing with his toy cars. Mom comes in and says, all right, Timmy, time to clean your toys up. And as a result, Timmy begins to whine and ends up with a few extra minutes to play with his cars. So all of these are examples of positive reinforcement because something was added um, to this scenario that was then reinforcing their behavior, whatever that behavior was in that scenario. So the opposite is negative reinforcement and that's getting out of something unpleasant or aversive. So um, some examples of that include Kamal's mom gives him peas for dinner. He begins throwing the peas on the floor and his mother takes the peas away and gets him something else. Um, another one is Veronica's baby sister begins to scream and Veronica covers her ears. Veronica's mom takes her sister into the other room. So the key with negative reinforcement, usually the word negative um, means something negative, but in this case, it's just something is being taken away after the behavior that's causing the behavior to continue. So um, you can see from these examples that if they continue to engage in that behavior and get the thing that they want um, removed, taken away from that scenario, then they're more likely to engage in that behavior again to get the same outcome in the future. Um, and what's really important is just making a change. So if a challenging behavior occurs, so whether that be screaming, hitting, throwing items, hitting self, whatever that behavior looks like, um, the important thing is to determine why it's happening or the function. So like we talked about, you could categorize it into access. They want to gain access to something. They want to escape. They want your attention, or maybe it's sensory or self-stimulation. And then from there, once you know why the behavior is happening, you can determine an appropriate replacement behavior. So if it's access, let's say to a ball, uh, you could have them say, I want the ball before you give them the ball. Or if they're trying to escape something, um, let's say a loud noise, like a siren went off and they um, don't like loud noises, maybe you could get them to put on headphones. Um, if it's attention, you could have them tap you on the shoulder or say your name. And then if it's sensory or self-stimulation, um, you could have them engage in um, a different behavior that they um, wouldn't be able to do if they were engaging in that self-stim behavior, like hands in your lap if they were flapping their hands. And then um, it's not likely that your child is going to go from engaging in an undesirable behavior to automatically just engaging in one of these new behaviors by themselves. So you may have to prompt the behavior um, or help them out until they learn um, how to engage in that new behavior by themselves. So you could do that by modeling what you want them to do or what you want them to say. You could give them a direction um, of what you want them to do. You could use gestures as a subtle hint um, as to what they're supposed to do. Or if needed, you could provide some physical prompts that show them exactly what you want them to do. But you do have options in the way that you can teach those behaviors. So in summary, we try and make sure our children get the things they want for the things that we deem socially acceptable because for a while now, um, many of them have gotten what they want by engaging in those undesirable behaviors. So it's our job as caregivers to make sure that socially desirable behavior is easy um, and that they can actually get what they want. So when you're prompting them to do something else that's more desirable than um, the behavior they were engaging in before, just make sure that what you're asking them to do is achievable and that they will be able to um, actually complete that behavior. And then it's also good to note that sometimes they may lapse or revert to old ways. Um, and if that happens, just try to ignore if at all possible and continue being consistent um, with attending to the socially desirable behavior. So the more consistent that you are with um, withholding reinforcement for those undesirable behaviors and only reinforcing their desirable behaviors, the more um, positive results you'll see whenever um, they are engaging in those new behaviors. 
And just a reminder, again, the replacement behavior that you're giving them should be easy for them and they should be contacting success in that way. So if they aren't, um, or if it seems too hard for them, then that's okay. You can just adjust um, the behavior. So this is the poll that I was wanting to launch earlier. So I'm going to launch it here now, but if you don't mind, um, answering this poll that you see on your screen. So it says, Jimmy wants a cookie because he's reaching for it, but you just got home from the store and have to put the milk in the refrigerator. Jimmy can vocally say that he wants a cookie, but he starts to cry and flops on the ground. What can you do? So there are four different options here of choices that you can make. And then I will talk briefly about um, which one is the most correct. All right, thank you so much for participating. The correct answer here would be to wait for him to calm down and then have him say cookie. So um, the reason why that is the correct answer is you wanna make sure that he is not engaging in the undesirable behavior to access the cookie. So you wanna wait for him to calm down and then have him engage in that replacement behavior so that um, that behavior is being reinforced. All right, so now I will turn it over to Connie and Jessica to present their slides. Awesome, thank you. Um, so now we are gonna go over an introduction to speech therapy. Um, so speech therapy is the assessment and treatment of communication, language, and speech disorders. This includes a variety of speech disorders, language disorders, pragmatic or social skills, AAC, and feeding and swallowing disorders. And we'll talk more about these different aspects in the upcoming slides. Um, as speech therapists, we receive extensive education in the development of speech language and feeding, and our education allows us to meet your child where they're at developmentally and provide strategies for your child to communicate successfully in a variety of different settings, which include the home, academic settings, communities, and social environments. We use a holistic approach to treatment, which means that we look at your child as a whole and work as a part of a team in order to help your child reach their goals and their potential. Um, looking at speech, speech is how we say our sounds and words. This is often the only thing people assume that speech therapists do, but it's just one part of our field. We use skilled intervention methods to elicit correct articulation of sounds and words, following an extensive evaluation to determine what sound errors are occurring and why they are occurring. Some common speech disorders include articulation and phonological disorders. Articulation refers to an individual sound error, um, most commonly sometimes for families, you know, a frontal lisp. Um, phonology refers to patterns of errors, and that's when children replace all like sound with another sound. So for example, replacing the er sound with a W sound, the w sound. Other speech disorders are childhood apraxia of speech, which is a motor-based speech disorder, and dys dysarthria, which is due to low tone and overall muscle weakness. Speech disorders also include fluency disorders, um, more commonly referred to as stutters and voice disorders. Um, so language makes up a huge part of our scope of practice. We focus on specifically three main areas, which are expressive, receptive, and pragmatic language. Um, I'll go over, go over expressive and receptive language first. Um, expressive language, which refers to the words that we use and how we use them to share ideas and get what we want. And this includes the form or structure of our language. Um, so grammar and syntax or sentence structure, which includes pronouns, past tense verbs, complex sentences, as well as the content of our language, which refers to our vocabulary. Um, when we work on receptive language, we're focusing on how we understand language. So to improve receptive vocabulary, we may may work on following directions, identifying objects, places, and people, um, understanding WH questions, and understanding basic concepts. Um, we, under, we target these things in natural and meaningful environments to help promote understanding. And for most children, this means during routines, such as getting dressed, um, bath time, eating dinner, as well as during play. And we'll talk more about play specifically and its role in speech therapy later on in the presentation. 
Next, we'll look at pragmatic and social language. Um, the next area um, is our pragmatic and social language. This is how we use our language at certain times and how we change our language based on the situation or the person that we're communicating with. We use language for so many purposes, including greeting, informing, commenting, protesting, sharing information, asking questions, and requesting. This also includes conversational rules like initiating and ending conversations, turn-taking, and staying on topic. Nonverbal language is also a part of pragmatic language, um, which includes interpreting your own and other people's facial expressions, as well as body language. Um, and these skills are important for perspective taking and learning emotions. Um, so now as promised, we'll talk about play skills. Play is so important for language development and it's important to remember that play looks different for everyone because everyone has different interests and finds enjoyment in different ways. Um, it's important to figure out what your child is interested in and to start getting interested in that as well. Play is how children learn about the world around them and begin to interact with it. Through play, we learn about problem solving, forming relationships, developing social skills, and learn and use language. There are many different types of play. We have functional play, which focuses on playing with toys according to their functions, such as rolling a car. Symbolic play, which is using objects as re representation for other things, such as a banana as a phone. Representational play, which includes uh, pretend play when a child uses objects in appropriate ways, such as playing in a kitchen set and making food. Um, developmental stages of play um, go more into um, five different parts. So we have solitary play, which is when a child plays alone, which occurs between zero to two years. Um, onlooker play, which is when a child watches and observes other children playing, which happens around two years old. Parallel play, when a child plays alongside or near others, but does not play with them, which is about two years or older. Associative play, when a child starts to interact with others during play, but there's not much cooperation or reciprocal play. Um, and a good example of this would be a ton of kids playing on a playground, but doing different things. Um, that occurs between three to four years old. Um, and cooperative play, which is when a child plays with others and has interest in both the activity and the other children that are playing, which occurs at four or older. And as SLPs, we work to help your child develop play skills. And as we play, we are deliberately embedding language to help your child's language grow as they learn to play. Um, next, we'll switch gears up a little bit and talk um, briefly about augmentative and alternative communication, or commonly referred to as AAC. AAC provides way to communicate, supplement, or compensate for spoken language. We all use AAC every day. Some ways that we use AAC every day is by using text message, emails, pointing, reaching, um, and other forms. AAC includes low technology strategies like pointing and picture exchange, and high technology devices that generate voice. It's important to note that AAC is often used as a tool or strategy to assist your child in communicating and can include a variety of modalities, all of which should be accepted and honored. Um, next, we're gonna take a quick poll to see um, what you think about AAC. Um, the question is, do you think using AAC prevents spoken language from developing? Okay, thank you for your participation. Um, just gonna talk briefly about it um, by debunking the myth that by saying that AAC does not prevent spoken language from developing. The research actually suggests the opposite. It can help, um, AAC can help to facilitate spoken language. Um, again, AAC should be viewed as a tool in your child's communication toolkit. We want to make communication as easy as it can be for your child by giving them the tools they need to be successful. Um, let's go over some more. We'll go over some more um, misconceptions about AAC. Um, so myth number one is that the use of AAC will reduce the motivation to use natural speech and would delay language and social development. Um, we already talked about briefly in the poll, but this is not true. Often spoken language can be difficult for children. In these cases, communication becomes unmotivating. By offering tools to help communication to be 
um, to be more su successful, you're actually increasing motivation to communicate. Once communication is successful and motivating, um, motivating for motivation for language increases and we can focus on increasing their language skills. Um, myth number two, our children are too young to use AAC. Um, and the other is that prerequisite skills are required and individuals with cognitive deficits cannot learn how to use AAC. Um, both of these are not also not true. The sooner we start AAC, the better. As I mentioned above, our focus is making communication easier, more successful, and more motivating for children. Um, with this comes room to focus on improving language. As SLPs, we provide assessment and ongoing treatment, training for family, and for anyone who might serve as a communication partner for your child. It is our goal to make sure we, are select, we select the appropriate form of AAC and make everyone involved feel comfortable with using the AAC device. Um, so now we'll get into feeding and swallowing. Um, as SLPs, feeding and swallowing disorders are a part of our scope of practice. Feeding and or swallowing issues should always be viewed from a team approach because it's often so complex and there are so many things that could be affecting your child's difficulty in these areas. Some common team members may include SLPs, OTs, nutritionists, BCBAs, ENTs, and child psychologists. Using a team approach, we address areas in red flags such as picky selective eating, difficulty with biting, chewing, swallowing, difficulty with drinking from a variety of cups and using straws. Okay, and now we're gonna talk about occupational therapy services. Okay, so I'm gonna start off with what is occupational therapy? So. First, I'm gonna define what an occupation is. So it's any activity that occupies your time. So our clients here at Beerman have many meaningful occupations that may include play, social participation, activities of daily living. So think about your eating, brushing your teeth, dressing, toileting, um, instrumental activities of daily living. So maybe meal preparation, community mobility, care of others and pets for some of our older kids, um, education, leisure, and also sleep. So our main focus for OT within pediatrics, so that's with our kiddos out at Beerman ABA, um, would be to develop fine motor skills so that um, the child is able to grasp and release toys and develop good handwriting and computer skills for school, um, improve eye-hand eye coordination so that they can play and do needed school skills such as copying from the blackboard or participating in a gym class. Um, master and also master basic life skills such as bathing, dressing, brushing teeth, and self-feeding. And that's something that often can um, overlap a little bit on the ABA side as well. Um, so this just kind of breaks it down into different fine motor skills, um, gross motor skills and visual motor skills. So when I'm talking about fine motor skills, I'm talking about maybe handwriting skills or pre-handwriting skills, which would be lines and shapes. Um, scissor skills, uh, developmentally appropriate grasp pattern on a variety of items. Um, a lot of times they look at on, you know, a writing utensil, a marker to color with, uh, maybe blocks, um, beads, uh, buttons, zippers, um, completing a puzzle, grasping the sides of clothing to put on or to take off, um, and the hand strength to complete, um, putting on or taking off clothes or other fine motor tasks. For gross motor, um, a lot of times I'm looking at throwing and catching a ball, um, kicking a ball, balance and body awareness throughout play and daily activities. Um, so think about like your child engaging on a playground. Are they able to um, successfully navigate the playground? Um, pulling a shirt overhead or placing both legs into the pant leg during dressing, upper and um, lower body strength to carry out all of these everyday activities. Um, and also visual motor skills. Um, might include scanning and tracking during handwriting or throwing, catching a ball, um, scanning during completing puzzles, eye-hand coordination um, during any of these tasks, such as, or maybe bringing a spoon or fork to your mouth um, or building with blocks. Um, so all of those kind of go hand in hand and I kind of work on those simultaneously too. Um, okay, so we're gonna launch a quick poll um, about GRASP. So the poll is, when is it developmentally appropriate for your child to use a dynamic tripod grasp as pictured when using a writing utensil?
Great, great. Thank you guys so much. So I'm going to go over the answer to this poll. So um, you can go to the next slide, Kelsey. Sorry. Um, so this kind of gives you a, a really great picture of what um, the developmental progression of a pencil grass. So the correct answer is that four to five years, um, where you can see on there, it says four and a half to five years. Um, so it kind of starts at, we call it a Palmer supinate grasp um, from one and one and a half years. So they're kind of just like totally gripping it. Some people call it like a fisted grasp when they're coloring and they're kind of using their whole arm to color. Um, digital pronate grasp between two and three years. So you're, you're holding it kind of um, at an angle, but now your palm is facing toward the paper instead of with the gross grasp, you were kind of holding it um, kind of more towards the ceiling. Um, and you're still kind of moving with your whole body, but maybe getting some more movement in the wrist or the elbow. Um, static tripod between three and a half and four years. Um, so you're kind of, in this picture, he's, sh he's shown using a small piece of chalk. So he might be kind of, it's kind of in between that digital pronate grasp and the tripod. Um, and then we get to between four and a half and five years, that tripod grasp. Sometimes it's a quadrupod grasp, which just means it's four fingers instead of the three, which is actually what I use. Um, one of the things that I also put on this slide is one of my favorite OT interventions for working on pencil grasp is using a small crayon, um, just breaking the crayon and to help promote that tripod grasp. So if you think about it, if you're giving someone, I was trying to see if I had a pen around here, but I don't. Um, if you hand a kid, you know, a super long pencil, like a regular pencil, they're going to, they might hold onto it like this. If you gave them something really small, it's really hard to hold it like this. And it's going to prompt um, a more functional grasp. And it might be kind of hard at first, um, but it's a way to jump in there with less prompting and still work on that grasp. Um, another one of my favorite OT interventions for working on this is having um, your child write, color, or draw on a vertical or slanted surface. Um, it promotes extension of the wrist, um, which helps promote that functional grasp too, and create more movement um, at the lower part of the arm rather than at their shoulder where they're using their entire arm because that's super tiring. Um, so you don't even have to get anything fancy. You could even just use... Um, if you had like an extra three ring binder that you took the papers out, that's a slanted surface. If you wanna get like a large roll of paper and put it on the wall so they can color when they're standing up on the wall. Um, those are some ideas too. Um, so another part of my scope of practice is feeding and eating. Um, and this is something where I really collaborate with speech therapy and the ABA side. Um, so a lot of times I address utensil use. Um, so the ability to use spoons or forks, the ability to maintain their grasp on the spoon and fork. Um, I might use built up handles or something weighted. Um, those forks up in the corner, I believe they're Munchkin brand. I think I've bought them at Target before, but also Amazon. I really like these um, to work on feeding um, because it is a thicker handle. Um, and a lot of times that can help with your child's grasp. Um, I saw one of the kids at one of the clinics one time and he was having such a hard time using his fork. And I took a look at his fork and it was just, it was an adult fork, so it was long and thin. Um, and I gave him this fork and he was able to use it way better. Um, limited diet, so I might take a look at food expansion through food cheating, food player interaction, step-by-step -step introduction to new foods or non-preferred foods. Um, and that's something I also a lot of times collaborate on the ABA side so that the child is um, getting kind of the same thing across the board. Um, oral motor skills, so I might look at um, the ability to chew foods and keep foods inside your mouth, ability to feel the food in your mouth. Um, sometimes hyposensitive kids overstuff or pocket their food um, and or drink from a straw or an open cup. And this is also where I a lot of times collaborate with speech therapy. Um, sitting at the dinner table, I talk about a lot. So if you see the child up on the left-hand corner, um, he's sitting with his feet flat on the floor. So his ankles are at a 90 degree angle, his um, knees are at a 90 degree angle, and his hips are at a 90 degree angle, and his arms are resting comfortably on the table. Um, this is the position that um, would be the ideal position because it appropriately supports your child um, while they're eating or this child up here, he is like drawing and coloring. 
Um, one example I like to give is, um, so say you went to a restaurant and you get like a, a bar tabletop, what with one of the higher ones and you're on a bar stool and you go to sit down and the rungs are missing from where your feet need to go. So your feet are just dangling and how uncomfortable that is makes you just want to stand up. Um, that sometimes our kids are feeling when they go to sit down at the table and their feet are just dangling and, um, it, they want to get up and run around. Um, so maybe that paired with, you know, they're already have, you know, high energy and they want to run around anyways, they're definitely going to get up from the table. So that's something that I talk about a lot. Um, your child definitely needs support for their body first before trying to eat. Um, and then conversations around food. Um, so I just kind of give tips on talking about food in a positive way, um, trying to avoid good for you food and bad for you food, and kind of just talking about the food in general, um, family style serving, and um, the focus on um, not being on your child um, to limit stress for them. It's hard trying new foods. Um, and I also included a great resource for everything food related. There's, I think they have an Instagram page and this is a website, um, on here and I can always put it in the chat, but, um, it's called kids eat in color and it's a registered dietitian who, um, she specifically talks a lot about kids and food. Um, and I think it's a great resource that I use often. And then another um, part of my scope of practice is dressing. So I um, think fine motor related skills such as zippers and buttons, grasping clothing to pull it on and take it off. I know I talked a little bit about that before. A lot of times with our, our kids, I start with socks. Um, gross motor skills related to dressing. So balance when putting on pants, their core strength when sitting on to put on socks and pants, um, threading their arms and legs through the pants. Um, a dressing tip I put on here is, um, try and have your child use hair scrunchies to pull over their foot at first to practice putting on socks kind of like allows them to see, okay, I have to pull all the way open to get it over my foot. That's a lot of times the hardest part. Um, and so I also included a little bit about what is, oh, speech therapy and occupational therapy look like at Beerman. Um, is this you Kelsey? <laughs> I can take over if you want me to. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so at Beerman, um, we have a couple of different models that we um, do when it comes to collaborating with uh, speech and OT. So we have the consultation model. So this is not billed to an insurance company. It is a team approach by collaborating with the ABA team, the parent or guardian, the OT or speech provider, any provider, um, that is currently working with your child. So it's very collaborative um, and everybody is working together toward the same goals. Um, it assists in treatment planning. So during this, um, the speech therapist or the occupational therapist will um, assist in that treatment planning process and attend parent training. So um, like I said, this is a service that Beerman offers. Um, Specifically, if you um, aren't able to get insurance coverage for those services, or if you just want additional services. So, um, like I said, this isn't billed through your insurance. This is just something additional or something that you um, decide that you would like for your child, but this is an option at Beerman. Um, and then we also have the direct service model, which is billed to the insurance company. So, that will be insurance authorizing. Um, these specific hours for you or for your child. And then once approved for direct services for um, either speech or OT, um, you, would, you would get a notification um, and be sent a parent intake form. Um, there would be a scheduled and completed comprehensive speech and language evaluation. You would schedule a parent meeting to discuss results and recommendations. So this would be done for you as the parent these things would be um, given to you. Um, these services would begin providing, um, the services would begin um, during your child's day at Beerman. So um, throughout their day, they may have one hour a week um, that is devoted to either speech or OT um, or whatever your insurance company um, decides to authorize. And then provide ongoing parent education and continue to attend parent meetings. Um, and continue to collaborate with ABA team, occupational therapy and outside providers. So um, we do have the luxury at Beerman to be collaborating together frequently. Um, so 
if um, these direct services are happening during ABA therapy time, um, the staff, um, the ABA staff is able to observe speech sessions and occupational therapy sessions. The BCBA is able to collaborate with those specialties and um, we're all able to work toward the same um, similar goals within our scope of practice. So before we jump into questions, I know we've had a few questions in the chat and in the Q&A. Um, we're gonna save those for after these slides, but just a few key takeaways from the ABA portion of this webinar are to define the target behavior, uh, make sure that you're understanding the why of behavior, those functions of behavior. After you understand that, you can identify a replacement behavior to teach. You want to make sure you're always reinforcing that appropriate behavior and making sure that your child knows that they're getting good things whenever they engage in those behaviors. You're going to withhold reinforcement from the target or challenging behavior so that they are not contacting reinforcement for engaging in those behaviors you want to decrease. And then just remember to stay consistent um, whenever you are teaching them new skills and whenever you're withholding that reinforcement so that they know which behaviors are gonna get them that reinforcement and which behaviors are no longer going to get that, them that reinforcement. Um, some key takeaways for speech is that um, we presented on all the different ways um, and areas that as a speech therapist can assess and treat. So if you have any concerns in any of these areas, you can reach out to our team to pursue um, some speech services. And then some key takeaways for OT um, are just, you know, an overview of what OT kind of um, takes a look at with our kids. So developing fine motor skills, gross motor skills, visual motor skills, and daily living skills, um, and feeding in order to um, improve your child's independence with all those skills. Okay, so just before we open it up to questions, some frequently asked questions about the webinar specifically are, will I be able to access this webinar again? The answer is yes, this webinar is recorded and you will be sent a link a few days after the webinar with the link to the recording to the Beerman's YouTube channel, where um, on that YouTube channel, you will be able to um, have access to any of our previously recorded trainings as well. And if you are wondering who you should contact with further questions, especially if you have specific questions for your child, if you're a family on our wait list, if you're participating in our interim care services, uh, the BCBA that has been assigned to you during that interim care process time will be your go-to person for questions. If you're not in interim care, then you can contact your center's clinical director. If you're a current client with Beerman, you can contact your current BCBA or your current um, speech and language pathologist or occupational therapist. Um, and then if you're a prospective client and you um, don't fit within any of those categories yet, then feel free to reach out to info at BeermanABA.com and they should be able to direct you um, to the appropriate person for those services. And if you have any questions specific to this webinar tonight, you can feel free to email treva at beermanaba.com with any questions about the webinar specifically. And just so you know, um, you are able to access any of our future webinars. You can sign up at this link listed here and all webinars are at 8 p.m. Eastern time um, and you can find which webinars are coming up on that website. So thank you guys so much for your participation. Um, we are going to open the floor up to questions right now. Um, and as I mentioned before, if there are any very specific questions for your child, and if we don't feel like we have enough information to um, give you an appropriate response, like I said, you can talk to those people um, that I mentioned before. Um, but if we are able to answer your question, then we will do so now. So I'm gonna go through the chat um, really quickly. Um, so the webinar link, um, if you're talking about the one for the website, um, whenever you are sent the email um, about this webinar and the link to this specific webinar, I think you should be able to access the other webinars. Um, but I will also have Treva include um, the link to sign up for the future webinars as well. 
and then I am going to go through the question and answer section too. So um, if you did not get your question answered about our collaboration and you have um, more specific questions, we'd be happy to answer those as well. Um, one of the questions here is, do you do your own evaluations or will you take evaluations from other organizations? So um, specifically for um, ABA, we do have different assessments that we complete. Um, they are pretty specific assessments for um, the beginning, but then they are personalized assessments just depending on your child's specific needs as they start services. So um, those can look differently um, based on your child. So for that question, I would probably just reach out to um, the clinical director at your location or your BCBA. Um, but I'll let you guys um, talk about your specific. Yeah, so for speech and OT, um, we do look at if you have um, another evaluation for speech or OT through a different organization, we would love to take a look at that when they're coming to Beerman. Um, but we do also do our own evaluation at Beerman. And I think the same is for um, speech services as well, right guys? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, another question we got was, do you only offer in-person on-site services or is there a virtual offering? Um, I know for ABA specifically, if you're talking about um, providing services to your child, really um, on-site services are all that we have available right now. Um, but with that being said, there are parent training options that are virtual. So it wouldn't necessarily be fulfilling the um, like one-on-one -on -one ABA therapy requirement, but we do have options of receiving um, additional parent training um, virtually. Do you guys have anything to add with that specific to your um, no, I don't think so. I think um, ours might be the same. Um, we might be able to offer some parent trainings. I'm not sure if we do at this time, um, but everything else is on site. And if you guys have any additional questions um, to the ones that you provided in, in the chat, um, or if we didn't answer anything that you guys um, previously asked, please feel free to write those things in the chat now and we can stick around to answer a few more questions. But if you don't have any additional questions either, um, this is the end of our webinar. So um, if you don't have questions, we thank you for all of your participation um, and we hope that you, you learned something. Oh, I see that I missed another question too. It says, will you eventually have um, speech, um, speech services in all of your centers? So um, I don't know if we, if any of us really know the answer to that question, um, but I do know if those services aren't available to you at Beerman, that you can reach out to your behavior analyst or your clinical director and they can try to direct you um, to other outside providers. And I think too, Kelsey, I think that their goal is to have um, speech therapists at each center and occupational therapists at each center. So I think that's a current goal. Awesome. Okay, well, it looks like we don't have any more questions. So we're gonna go ahead and log off, but thanks again, everyone for your participation um, and to all of you panelists.